you're gonna have to say I'm sorry. You're gonna have to sit on Santa's lap. Oh, I want a lot of things for Christmas. No, there can only be one. Um, it's hard to get that voice because he's is. like whispering while also being very raspy and talking at like regular volume. He's like whispering at regular. Volume. Well, I mean, in the movie, it's eighty yard. Yeah, for sure. Like, uh, Whose idea was it <laughs> to hire him? I don't know, but apparently he was a major joy to work with in uh, the movie we're doing today, which is the. Well, uh, hold on one second, Max. Do you want to take a pause before you announce which movie this is? I know you're very excited. You know, Austin, I was going to do that without you having to say anything. All right, we'll I'm, take I'm, it from one. Take it one. All right, back to one. And action. In the movie we're doing today, which is the uh, 1995 film Mortal Kombat. Um, I don't, can, we do, can we go back to one? I don't think we got it. No, I think we're good. Hold on. I got to put my earphones back on now. No, don't you take off your earphones. Somebody has to be listening I to this. I thought we were stopping. God. No, I was making a bad joke. We're, you should be used to this by now. We're a disaster <laughs> today. Well, you refuse to admit whenever you make a bad joke. So, <laughs> Yes, uh, welcome to the Paul W.S. Anderson Film Podcast, where we do all of the best fil- oh, yeah, Paul W.S. So Anderson movies. I know. Like, okay. I mean, this is a pretty loosey-goosey intro, but also... I'm going to justify my bad jokes today by saying that I'm just flabbergasted that the first director we're doing two movies of. The first director we're double dipping on is Paul W.S. Anderson. Max, why? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I'm only responsible for one of the picks. Okay, you, I didn't expect you to follow up with another pick so soon from his oeuvre. Um, there's, yeah, so... Yeah, welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Max. He's Austin. Today Hello. We're, we're doing the 1995 not, yeah, film Mortal Kombat. Um, Mortal Kombat! Yes, uh, I promise you that's the last time we'll do that during this review. Um, God, I hope so. But, so yeah, this is my choice. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for it because unlike... Nor should you. Uh, some movies I choose, like, like look at the Rotten Tomatoes score for this. It's on the screen right now. It has the 38%. This is not like a traditionally good movie, but we did Bird Box last week and we like we were both kind of drained after Bird Box. I think I can speak for both of us on that. We were just No, like, I was fine. No, okay. We were both kind of like emotionally exhausted after that. So I'm like, we need to do an easier one. We need to just do something that's sort of fun and silly to watch. Um I was thinking about stuff for a while and then uh <laughs> a the a trailer for the new Mortal Kombat game dropped, and I'm just like, oh my god, there's the Mortal Kombat movie. We had talked about doing that before. And I figured, because filmmaking-wise, there's not a whole lot to talk about here, but I figured it would be a good springboard for other topics that I feel are more interesting to talk about. Also, for me, this movie, I'm not sure if you'd agree, it falls into the so bad it's good parts for a lot, and it's just... Charming set design, charmingly bad acting, charming, fun times. Also, fun fact, the fourth highest grossing video game movie of all time. Oh, do you know the other three that yes. are in front of it? Yeah, it's got to be a Resident Evil 1. No, one of those. Really? Actually, um, wow. You have uh, Tomb Raider. You have okay. uh, Prince of Persia. Ooh, Warcraft. No. Um, Ooh. At least at the time when this movie... Or no, not at the time, because those movies came out after. Um, and... The first Pokemon movie. Okay. Um, I, I'm assuming that Warcraft has probably surpassed it since the bit of trivia I found. That ah, fucking China. Yeah. I we'll link that back to... We'll connect that to another episode we've done in the past. Warcraft, of course, is directed by Duncan Jones, who is none other than the son of... Duncan Jacks. <laughs> Okay, no, but the, I appreciate that answer. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Let's just say yes. He's the son of Dun- Duncan Jacks. That's okay. what I was going for. Um, oh, God. He needs to be a character in this. Oh, I get Okay. <laughs> My response to the, your choice. I was at first flabbergasted. I thought it was hilarious. We were going to do D- Paul W.S. Anderson again. Um, and I know you were saying that you were cho- choosing this movie because you thought it would be like low effort, sort of uh, a, I mean, we could 
I don't want to say coast through it, but also it's not going to be like challenging. It's not like we're engaging with <laughs> a tradition of existing criticism on this movie. Um, however, you chose a movie that for me, I think is somewhat difficult to talk about or maybe not difficult, but just it offers a new experience to try to articulate for me because here's my experience with this movie. I watched it for the first time this week preparing and I think it is so incredibly stupid and at the same time, uh, not like necessarily offensively stupid. I think it's very much a situation where the idea and concept and very importantly, the script is very stupid, but the movie is okay with that. And because it's so earnestly commits to just doing its dumb script, it kind of overrides the stupidity at certain points. It doesn't necessarily override the repetitiveness and the runtime, but I guess my point is that this movie, while being incredibly stupid and not good, there's nothing that is like, I don't know, that I would reject outright from this movie or that I watch and I feel repulsed by. It's trying to have a lot of fun. It's spreading its budget a lot. I know we were talking about in the preview, we felt a lot that this was like a, uh, almost like a very sort of, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say high budget, but a very like um, sort of competently well done it's fan a well, film. It's a well-produced fan film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, not competent in the sense of like a script or something, but they just, they took the story that they had and they they sure did it. They definitely did it. And uh, yeah, I kind of, it has like a fun energy to it that I don't really, I haven't seen a lot of the Resident Evil movies, but I don't recognize that or remember it being in those. No. So it kind of makes me wonder what happened. Um, well, um, I'll expand on that and then I'll get into my own personal history with okay. this movie. Um, and then I think it might be useful to get into other personal histories with us. But um so what I think happened is because at the time, Paul W.S. Anderson was a pretty unknown director for the most part. I think this was his second movie. Yes. Okay. Um, and his first one didn't do, it didn't, I don't know anything fail, about it, but it didn't do that great. It's um, like an indie movie. Yeah. He was, he was basically unknown at the time. Um, a lot of other directors rejected this project and he was the one that they thought would do. Yeah. After he tried out for it, they thought he would do well on it. Um, he was actually an avid gamer at the time, and he was a fan of the Mortal Kombat right. yeah, games. So I think he genuinely like enjoyed it and had passion <laughs> for it. You can tell, yeah. Back then, so I think he would like actually tried to make a dead on Mortal Kombat thing. Which with Resident Evil, I'm not going to say anything definitively because I don't know the answer to this. But if you've ever watched any of the Paul W. S. Anderson Resident Evil movies, you get the feeling he's never played a Resident Evil game or ever even seen what one looks like because. At least for the first, like, I would say even four, like, Resident Evil, like, they're not really action movies. They're survival horror games. Like, you're supposed to feel enfeebled and it's just, like, actually scared of the things coming at you. Especially the first one. It's, like, combat is almost never the optimal solution to anything. It's just, like, right. you have a gun, but you use that as a last resort if you're cornered. You don't waste your bullets on Those every Those movies see, become, yeah. like, late 90s, early 2000s, like... Schlock sure. action, yeah. Um, yeah. And I also think that because this movie did so well at a huge opening, it like made eight times more than like the other movie that was opening the same weekend. Do you know what that movie was off the top of your head? Yes, The Babysitter's Club. Uh, oh, I've never heard of that. Uh, I always think that's fun, though, to learn like which movies came out the same day. Yeah, that movie fucking destroyed it. Apparently, the best one is The Thing in Blade Runner. Yeah. They both opened against a movie called Megaforce. With Barry Bostwick. And if you want yourself a laugh, you got to go look up <laughs> Megaforce with Barry Bostwick. Did Megaforce beat both of those in the box office? <laughs> I don't know if it beat them. Oh, God, I hope it didn't beat them. <laughs> I know none of those movies did particularly well, uh, but I really hope it didn't beat Blade Runner or The Thing. Uh, uh, speaking of movies that failed in the box office, uh, Paul W.S. Anderson was so terrified that this movie would bomb that apparently he took a vacation in Hawaii during the opening weekend of this movie. So he would be very far away from any bad news that Aww. happened over it. And then he found out that it like made $23 million and it's like opening weekend. And he's just like, Oh, he cried. <laughs> See, I hear stories about like that and I don't think he's like the best director, but I, this nineties version of Paul W. Sanderson, I think is like a really fun director who I would appreciate even though because you can tell in the camera moves he definitely cares and he's putting it's like an Ed Wood thing yeah you feel the sincerity 
Even if they're like reaching for things, they don't always get it. But in this movie, they don't get a lot of it. But you can tell they're reaching really as hard as they can. And uh, that definitely gives it a charm that even though this movie, I think, is like definitely of its time and it's only sort of something that pertains to a certain audience, it will have legs, I think, going forward into the future because it has that sincerity to carry it. And there's nothing like so outstanding or remarkable about it, whether that's good outstanding or bad outstanding, that would make it like really noticeable. But that feeling, that sensation you get from the people who made it, uh, definitely, I think, comes through even now. Oh, definitely. This movie is like, I joke, I don't think it's necessarily true, but like up there within Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies, like this is one of the most 90s movies ever. Of which <laughs> I've, I've seen neither of those. Oh, well, you, I need to just show you the Vanilla Ice segment. Oh, I've that. seen that yeah. plenty of times. Because who doesn't love Vanilla Ice randomly showing up in the middle of your... That should still happen. That should just like, Vanilla Ice should randomly appear. Didn't he almost home. die or something on an airplane? Sure. I think I read something last year about him like having appendicitis <laughs> or something on an airplane. <laughs> the last thing I heard from him, it was the second Michael Bay produced uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. He showed up to the premiere of that to do his song that he did for the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. What's with him doing? <laughs> I don't what know. What else was he doing? Oh, what is whatever. Vanilla Ice doing now? But um, Well, he's okay. waiting outside. We've got him as a guest. I would love... Can we please book Vanilla Ice? I would like genuinely love to talk to him to see how he's doing lately. He um, looks really tall. I don't know if he'd like fit very well in like between us. On, oh, like, well, he doesn't have his stool. hair anymore, so I think that takes away like a solid <laughs> takes foot. Takes away like a solid like half foot. Yeah, um, but anyway, we've talked about our... Anyway. <laughs> um, so my experience with this movie is... Um, and I think I want to transition to this to our experiences with the games because this is the first video game themed movie that we've done this podcast. Oh yeah, that's true too. Um, Mortal Kombat. I had very strict parents growing up. I was not allowed to see an R rated movie until I was like 15 years old. I was not allowed to play any sort of violent video games whatsoever. My parents heavily scrutinized any game that I was going to try to buy. Um, so Mortal Kombat, my experience was it with it was with what I assume a lot of our listeners are was I played it at a friend's house because all of us have those friends whose parents don't care and they're just like yeah you can get whatever game you want it's fine um, and also I would play it in the arcades I unfortunately grew up in the era just as arcades were dying but when they still had this at our local arcade in the mall I played it then um, to this day I have friends who are very good at fighting games. The Mortal Kombat 3, it's ever in the arcades. It's the only one I can consistently beat all my friends at. I have a long and loved history of the Mortal Kombat yeah, franchise. I'm still playing them to this day. I am eagerly anticipating the next one, which comes out later this year. Um, and I... My, yeah, some people might say, like, oh, well, you're a big fan of the game, so that's why you enjoy this movie, despite saying that it's not a great creative movie. Not really, because... I've never been one of those people who's just like, oh, I like this thing in a video game. It doesn't have to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I've never been one of those people who's just like, I've liked this thing in a video game. I want to see it in a movie now because I feel like if I wanted to see the thing that I saw in the video game, I would play the video game. Right. I mean, I'm sure there are a few that you would be curious of, but also even if you did see that, like y you and I, I think are the type of people where it's like, okay. If something is, a, this could be not necessarily about video games or anything. If something is adapted to a movie or whatever, and the movie is bad, I'll get on with my life. Yeah. And I'll still enjoy the thing <laughs> that I enjoyed originally. It's not going to upset me. It doesn't ruin the video game if the movie is bad. Right. But at the same time, like, this is just kind of like, for me, it's a goofy, bad 90s action kung fu movie. Right. That has a fun fantasy backdrop and also happens to be based on a video game franchise that I enjoy. Yeah. And I also, you bring up something interesting that I, uh, I don't know how much of a conversation there is for this, but I was going to wait until the movie, but I yeah. was thinking about this movie in terms of nostalgia and like, okay, there's nothing necessarily that really grabs my attention outright about this movie, despite it being kind of charming and enjoyable in the way that it is. And I was thinking like, at what point does a movie sort of transcend the nostalgia in terms of how people can appreciate it. Because this movie, I think, in terms of as an experience for me, 
I might watch it again at some point. I don't know when. Oh my god! I but it's weird. Besides Kubo and the Two Strings, I think that's the first movie that I have recommended that you've said that about. But it's so it's so such a weird thing. This the way this movie works because we both recognize that it's bad, right? And yet, in its striving and failure, it's good in a way that isn't necessarily being like so, so bad. bad. It's good. Yeah, it's like I en- like this movie inspires joy in me in like a different way than like my favorite bad movie, Miami connection might because like, uh, but I guess it's the sincerity in both of them. Right. In different ways. Like Miami connection, it's failing in so many different areas, but like it's sincere and whatever in every scene, you can feel that seeping through the movie. This movie it's based off a video game. The script, the script is paper thin. There's not that many great performances. in the <laughs> They movie. didn't even write it on a piece of paper. They just yeah. wrote it on a napkin. They, they, <laughs> the script is literally just all the character endings from the original Mortal Kombat arcade cabinet. Once you beat the story mode. Um, but they tried, you can like see it pouring through the map paintings and the set pieces and the costumes and the animatronics. And like, right. It's, you can see that they like, they were genuinely trying to bring the world to life. Whereas like, when you watch like a resident evil movie, which is like they, they include enough of like the things from the game in order to yeah, like legally it, be able to call it resident evil. It's like a safe bets thing. You yeah. recognize this, you recognize that if you've never played a yeah. resident evil game, but like you have some peripheral knowledge of video games, like, okay, well, you know, this guy, you know what this zombie looks like. You know, and this if you don't, you're name. like, what is this? Yeah. But no, that's an interesting thing to bring up in terms of this, because again, we feel that sincerity watching this, but this is totally an exploitation project in terms of somebody bro- bought the rights to the video game when it was becoming popular. Yeah. And they're like, we're going to make a money. <laughs> we're going to make money now. So they decided to throw a movie together and I'm sure uh, they slapped it together. Which in is weird. Cause like months, this movie is rated PG 13. It's was marketed heavily to kids at the time. Um, right. Again, that's the people who have the rights, not yeah. understanding what it is for a game that, at the time was most famous for creating the ESRB. Like right. they're the reason that every video game you buy now has a little rating in the corner is because Mortal Kombat came out and parents were utterly terrified. Right. <laughs> Which in itself is remarkable that like, yeah, the people just like, Oh, this is a hot new game that everybody's talking about. Let's like a movie about it. It's literally it the only kids. thing they knew about it was that it was popular. Yeah. Not that it was like people ripping each other's spines out or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting, weird elements in here where, again, we're, if we're comparing it to the Miami Connection, I think the way that we think of bad movies like that being enjoyable is that it's the disparity between what they achieved yeah. and the sincerity. Whereas with this, it's like they're going for something very clear and they kind of have like the beats in place for it. But they also don't even like fucking try. They just <laughs> care about like having cool sets and then like techno music or whatever. Like it's totally just an excuse to have these action scenes. But the problem is they're also not shot well or done well. No. So it's weird. It's a very weird experience. So I think this movie, even though there's maybe not a lot that I'd point to as like a strength or something particularly interesting about it. It was kind of like a strange experience for me to watch it. And I may watch it again at some point, or if in some sort of horrible future, I'm at like a mortal Kombat costume party or something. I'll put it on the background. Of course. Yeah. I, I, I can see you dressing up as uh, princess Kitana. That wonderful. Although that uh, fucking annoys me. What? Her name is Kitana. Come on. Okay. Ed Boon, I'm going to go back to the 90s when you made Mortal Kombat. I'm going to slap the shit out of you. Fun fact, though, the, his uh, Sonya Blade and Tanya, two of the major female characters in the games, are named after his two sisters. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Um, but I, there are other things I want to talk about in this movie, but um, other than that, I think it's a good time for round one. For coffee break? Fight. Oh. Oh, my God. Oh my god, I love a movie that doesn't waste any fucking time. I really hope that was just loud enough for <laughs> for our for audience to hear. to hear. Yeah, oh my god, this is like... This movie doesn't... like. If you had any doubts, you walked into the wrong theater. <laughs> hey, okay, I, I started laughing when I first started watching this, and then I texted you immediately yeah. about the way it began. I wish you had finished the movie that night because I was really enjoying like you live texting me your reactions to this right. film. 
Well, okay. The first thing I thought of was like, <laughs> I my flashback in my mind to like what oh not some nice some sweet digital fire effects oh, on the inside that. of that ring yeah I love that but the first thing I thought of was like just all the parents who took their annoying children to go see this movie opening night yeah and then they hear that as the first noise in the movie and they're like oh this is gonna be a long well, that movie. song is iconic though and like it like it's cheesy and silly and like if you listen closely it's just like that beat over and over again and like yeah. the them listing off the characters from Mortal Kombat 1. But, oh, uh, really? Yeah. Listen listen toward the end when they play during the credits. It's going to be like, Kano, Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade. That's a really sophisticated song. Um, But I would say one of the highlights of this movie is that soundtrack. Like, this, it may be very 90s, but, like, this movie has a fucking killer soundtrack. It definitely embraces the music. It and does. also, just in terms of, like, why this movie, despite being so stupid, kind of is okay, is because with... That is the most emphatic way you can embrace the stupidity of this movie is you begin your movie with a dumb song that begins with somebody screaming Mortal Kombat. <laughs> yeah, but like going on the soundtrack, you have one of my favorite industrial bands personally, of KMFDM featured feature on the soundtrack, Juke, yeah, Jukebox Jezebel. Um, surprisingly enough, the music video for that song uh, featured footage from this movie. I'm not surprised. And was pulled from MTV at the time because... People were calling in complaining it was too violent. Oh, that's fun. Which is funny considering this movie. Can we can we go for a digression? First? Sure. We just experienced an interesting moment though. Oh yes. When uh Shang Soon looks directly into the camera and then points at the audience accusingly, because they're Liu Kang. Although watching it this time I am confused that can his brother see him as well? His brother screams his name. Whatever. Well, yeah, and like he doesn't know that his brother died in the tournament yet. Like he knows his brother's dead. Well, his, yeah, he does. His grandfather said oh, that. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Is his grandfather the guy at the temple? Yes. Okay. Um, it's not Christopher Lambert. Also, you know who was originally supposed to play Liu Kang? Who? Uh, Brandon Lee. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, he died right before the production of this movie started. Um, and it kind of would have been fitting because, yeah, Liu Kang is based off of Bruce Lee, his father. Um, not the first time that a character who was based off of a martial arts... Uh, actor <laughs> was about to be in this movie and then decided not to be uh johnny cage who will be introduced to after this wonderful rave sequence um was originally going to be played by john claude van damme who turned down the role to be in the street fighter movie oh yeah i love a good 90s rave by the way yeah. these people are so concentrated on their raving that they cannot be bothered by like Listen, they're on a lot of fucking ecstasy. Like People with shotguns pushing them out of the way. Yeah. No, they're on a lot of ecstasy. They're just like, ah, oh, I love everybody. Let's dance to this techno how music. how sweaty this guy is. Kano is like... I was surprised that like... Actually, hold on. What? Hold that thought. I'm noticing. Before we get too far, here's the... We should focus. We have to like prioritize what we want to say at the beginning because here's the thing. Yes. We have not said yet during the commentary track itself how terrible the script is for this movie and this is a good moment because he's about to t refer to a an eye seeing dog well no th this is something you don't get he's basically saying like if if you hurt her before the tournament i'm gonna stab your good eye out i understand what he's saying yeah i don't understand why you wrote it as a seeing eye dog why the hell would anyone write it like that what the hell does that i don't like, know what is wrong so here's my point though is that we're getting these character introductions during this beginning sequence, right? All of it is very sloppy. And it's all very abrupt and schlocky. Where it's just like, what's going on? I don't know. Who's the heck guy? Yeah, why are there people dancing after they shot? Why is that crane there? Why are people dancing Number after one, she fired like, a shotgun? She just told Kano not to hurt her. So like, why would henchmen men come out and try to shoot a machine gun at her? Did she know that he was a bad guy? And this is after the fact where she said, you're talking to the only girl I trust. Yeah. Duncan. Also, like... Ooh, okay. This is, like... This is my favorite character introduction. Yeah, it, it's the best one. It's the most creative, yeah. even if it is the Rocketeer. But Although like, it has the worst acting. This guy's performance is... Whew, yeah. God. I kind of... Can you imagine if Jean-Claude Van Damme actually was Johnny Cage in this movie? I guess it would be marginally better. I have a fun casting conversation, which we can totally talk about forever, by the way, with this type of movie. But I had a dream cast in mind for this movie we can mention later. But I guess the point I wanted to get out of the way about these character introductions and why the sloppiness of a lot of these character introductions doesn't really bother I, either of us, I don't think, is because if you pay attention, 
the visuals are still interesting. Yeah. They're still putting effort into the way it looks visually, even if the visuals are kind of dated and also totally outlandish. Uh, Liu Kang wakes up and his entire room is green to the point where we were actually having a debate earlier about whether or not they shot it with like gels on the lights or if they just turned it to like monochrome green (laughs) in post post or something. Uh, So, I mean, it's very interesting. And I think the, the way this movie looks visually, I like it. And I think even though I compare it in, in my mind to stuff like Mario Bava lighting or Michael Mann lighting, and I don't think it's as good as either of those. Oh, wait, do you want to bring up the fact that the guy in the director chair right here was originally supposed to be Steven Spielberg? Because he's supposed to be a big fan of Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Was he also playing at your friend's house? I, I don't remember. I just remember uh, spamming, stabbing people as Baraka because that's what I used to do. <laughs> but yeah, it's really unfortunate. He was that director in the chair looks just like him. But you know, it's like he uh, he was going to be in this movie because I guess he uh, is a big fan, and then uh, he had scheduling conflicts. Yeah. This is right around a very busy time for him. So Schindler's List and Jurassic Park, and also well, Amistad. But no one really cares about Amistad. True. But yeah, if you look at the visuals of this, it's very subtly kind of surreal. They are on a film set, but you have somebody running a smoke machine in the behind them for no reason, right? It's very 90s, but the movie doesn't care about explaining it. And we'll see more of that when we see the people welding shit on the dock. It doesn't make sense, but it looks cool, right? And uh, I kind of oh appreciate God, no. that can effort. We, can we save that for when we get to the dock? Yeah. Because it's utterly ridiculous. All I'm saying is that even though it doesn't quite reach what Michael Mann or Mario Bava are able to do in the way there's mo- their movies look, I think it still achieves something singular and something that kind of works for this movie. And I appreciate that. And I really enjoy it. You know, it makes me not care as much about the script because the movie doesn't seem to be as interested in that. And again, that just goes in with the movie being like, Hey, we're going to open with somebody screaming mortal combat on the soundtrack. And you're going to know what this is and you're not going to, your expectations will be lined up to the rest of the movie perfectly. Also, I was mentioning before, like they, they, the script of this movie makes like no sense. They had to go off like the character bios and the one paragraph you get if you beat the story mode in the arcade cabinet. But wouldn't it make more sense like for Raiden to be tricking them into participating in the tournament if you're Shang Tsung? Yeah. Wouldn't you like want like the shittiest possible people? To- yeah, why would you be tricking the good people into going? Yeah. Unless it's because you think they're going to fail and you want their like, and the think, good people have juicier souls. I think that would make uh, it more fun if it was Raiden because Raiden's like a Because he's kind of shady. He's kind of anyway, shady yeah. and like laugh. Like it would make more, it would make sense because he's like seems like a prankster. And you know he's lying because he's wearing a wig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look at the shot, right? We get this really cool shot and it's, you can tell they're trying. They just, they went on location. They, you know, bothered to say like, okay, we're going to have all these people who are just local people. They had, they're like, here are our outfits, everybody. We're making a movie. You're going to stand in this formation. Who wants to be in Mortal Kombat? What's Mortal Kombat? <laughs> right. But I mean, this t- idea of movie making is really fun to me. You know, and when you see them do a really dramatic shot like that, it's kind of like, oh, I see you. You're stretching a budget, but you're making it work. You're finding a way to do it. Even if the end product is this movie, you're still taking something and making something out of it. And I think that's creative in a way that doesn't feel like stupid or like it's drawing attention to the fact that this is basically people in a boardroom somewhere uh, saying this is our hot property. Yes. We're going to make a movie from this. It's like, no, somebody is trying somewhere, it's even funny. if the script is stupid. <laughs> it is funny that this wasn't uh, produced by Warner Brothers. Was, they now own Mortal Kombat and make a lot, a lot of money <laughs> off of it. Right. They saw. And I kind of, I'll save that conversation for later. I know you and I were talking about this, but I think this movie could get an interesting remake. I think there's some possibilities. They for did. It. I think before, I think it was before Mortal Kombat 10 came out. They did like, a short form live action show hmm. about the characters and it's like so bad like nobody wants it it's available for free for download on steam and like right. nobody wants it i mean this here's the thing you can't do a show about this yeah. why because nobody wants to watch this for the duration of an entire show i know you have a lot of characters but like i don't like you can't do that <laughs> well that's the thing like if you want to focus on all your characters, have chapters in your video game do that, which NetherRealm Studios has learned and arguably has the best story mode in modern fighting games in general. Right. And I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but I've never played any of the games because I'm generally not 
the type of person who wants to put that much effort into like <laughs> a fighting game. Well, into like memorizing moves for a fighting yeah. game. I I am. I um I'm not that great at fighting games. I still play a lot of them a lot of the time. <laughs> um I am stupid excited for Mortal Kombat 11, but um there's some cool character things not necessarily in this movie but i imagine there's cooler versions of them i looked up like different characters in preparation for this movie and they sure look cool some of them if you do want to try um after mk11 got a trailer yesterday it's like seven dollars on steam right now so the new one no 10 oh. the, the most recent one before this yeah so by the way we if this were another movie we might be making fun of how weird it is that christopher lambert is in this and his weird performance and accent and he's theoretically supposed to be an asian god but uh and also the fact that the lu kang who formerly did not believe in any of this uh sort of mumbo jumbo at all and chastised his grandfather for believing in it suddenly has so much faith that he wants to be the champion of the world and he's willing to fight a god to prove himself yeah it's quite a reversal over the course of no time at all (laughs) <laughs> well, and I love how he believes he's Raiden because, like, Raiden managed to flip him on his back. Right. I mean, we have the scene later on when he's on the boat. He's like, oh, you really are Raiden. But, like, so many questions. But, of course, none of it matters because this movie opens with the guy screaming, Mortal Co- Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'll bleep it out. <laughs> uh, I know you made a promise. I don't want to make a liar out of you. But the point is that that beginning is actually secretly very important because it lets you know what you're in for. And you're like, well, I'm ready for this now. Yeah. And then when it has a lot of effort put into this neat stuff, like the visuals and lighting, you're like, okay, you know this, I appreciate how much joy you're taking in, in doing this. Oh, look at it's welding night at the docks. Everyone, (laughs) everybody everywhere is welding everything. Basically they like had to get in touch with the steel workers union and, uh, all the people in Hollywood who (laughs) weld things worked. Oh my God. Uh, and the wonderful character of art is introduced here. Oh, hashtag art lean. Yeah. Our favorite art lean. God, Johnny cage. I know we were talking about this, but it's hilarious. His motivations are so shallow. The fact that he's so, he he's only motivated by people thinking he doesn't punch people for real. Yeah. And also I was talking about like, I don't care how famous of an actor you are. The tabloids aren't going to be focused on like, Oh, he doesn't really do his martial arts. They're going to be like focused on who he's sleeping with or like spreading rumors that he's gay or something like that. Yeah. Oh, this is this. I really love this moment, but it's almost unfortunate because, uh, for once in this movie, this is the only moment I can think of where somebody does a character behavior and we learn something about them without somebody literally saying it with words. It's very obvious what is being said here, that yeah. Johnny Cage is a dick. Also, some racism there? Yeah. I mean, the movie doesn't like dwell on any of that, but the point is that I love the idea... Well, I mean, I love the idea of having movies where they don't tell you literally everything. But every other character behavior in this is said by somebody. It's not like an obvious thing that they're doing. No, it's literally that they're saying it. It's as obvious as possible. Yeah. As explicit as possible. I wonder if, like, I don't know how many drafts of the script they went through for this movie, if any at all. But I honestly wonder, because they have art, because they didn't want to kill off any of the characters well the guy Jax is a character right yeah Jax is a character but he gets left behind i was wondering because in the games Jax has robot arms um i was wondering if originally they were gonna have Jax be the one to lose to goro originally and have his arms ripped off before they realized this was gonna be a pg-13 movie and they couldn't do that yeah um because that would make more Maybe. sense than making up a new character to die in the movie it's weird how the movie somehow navigates those threads without annoying you though but I don't like we're talking about all that, but really we should just dwell upon like, even though the script is bad, like how much this movie is just reveling in the set pieces. Yeah. Look at all that fog. Look at the fucking yeah. boat. Look at the boat. I love it. I know it's so goofy and silly and it's like they're on the pirates of the Caribbean ride. Yeah. But like the movie doesn't fucking care at all. It's just like, whatever. You know what I mean? Like it's not interested in trying to make yeah, it doesn't like make it less stupid. It doesn't dwell on the boat because like normally you would have like so many shots of it and like you would, and it's like no, that's the boat. Of course, that's the boat they're going to Mortal Kombat on. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah, th- like the movie is so accepting of all of its own ideas without any sort of criticism, and it's just very excited to actually bring it to the screen. And I think the difference is that the thing that saves it is that they got somebody who is actually kind of competent and excited to do it. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're like, you got a script? Sure, sure, I'll shoot it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I also, because like, Liu Kang doesn't have a lot of personality in the games. He has some, but like, he's mainly like Kung Fu honor man. Mm-hmm. I do like how he's just kind of a snarky asshole in the beginning of this movie. Like, yeah. Which kind of comes out of nowhere, because like, before he's like revenge-filled and like sad his brother died and like trying to be no-nonsense, I don't believe in gods, but then he's just like a snarky asshole to Johnny Cage, which is fun. It's a character trait. Like you said, he's the only one who like displays sort of character traits without saying them. Well, Johnny Cage displays a character trait, a negative one. Yeah. And then, but we have the fun of Liu Kang being like sassy. Yes. In response, which is cool. But also that brings up another point we were talking about. And I actually didn't have a lot of time to look into this, but I thought it was interesting. And I was going to reference this uh, in reference to um, the opening where we actually get that direct camera address from Shang Tsung, right? Although this is the introduction of the two would-be badasses in this movie. And the most iconic Mortal Kombat characters. Who <laughs> totally get shortchanged. Yeah. It's the same outfit. I know it is like the same outfit in the games, right? Yes, it well, is. Well, at least the earlier ones. They look more specific now. They do. Um, but Yeah, no, I, for, I'm for i assuming any of our video game savvy yeah, listeners know this, but uh, arcade machines had very limited storage space available back in the day and in order to fit more characters there's a lot of early mortal Kombat characters which are just palette swaps of the other ones with different special moves you're gonna want to pause for this radical special effect i don't understand why they they made us the spear like a bird thing <laughs> it's so funny because in that shot it's like they go from the reaction shot to him doing that and it's supposed to be like a big oh fuck moment but the thing is structurally any sort of um exclamation point grammatically in terms of a shot or something will also play like a joke. Yeah. So you have to actually have it work in order to have the emphasis on it. And if it is not really as cool as you think it is, then it's going to wind up playing as a joke because that's the way a joke works. A joke has a punchline, right? (laughs) And that's why that shot is funny. But yeah, so like we're just going to skip over all the plot nonsense, but like, yeah, but I do like, I, I don't know. I like every scene where Chris Lee <laughs> talks. He's just, <laughs> but yeah. So, uh, I guess what we, we were talking about before we got sidetracked by Scorpion and, um, sub zero is, uh, this movie's relationship with young adult fiction and superhero stuff. And the way it's sort of in this movie, we get tastes of both of those things that I think would become way more popular and sort of like uh, streamlined as like storytelling formulas um, in the 2000s, right? Yeah. But I was starting to bring it up when you mentioned the way uh, Liu Kang was interacting with... uh, uh, Is not Nick Cage? Cage. (laughs) Not Nick Cage. Not Nick Cage. Um, (laughs) Oh, God, look at that smoke. Look at that smoke machine. Oh, my God. Although Nick Cage would have been an interesting (laughs) casting choice. He would have been... (laughs) That would be very interesting. Uh, As Liu Kang, you mean? Uh, no, I was going to say... As Raiden. As Johnny Cage, I would have liked that. Oh. As Raiden. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> just imagining <laughs> Nick Cage's face with that wig. But you were I was bringing that up in reference to the way Liu Kang was uh, interacting with Johnny Cage and the sassiness. And kind of when we get through this movie, we have these characters who sort of don't like each other at the beginning, but at a certain point, they like kind of immediately flip a switch and they start talking to each other like friends. Yeah. And it feels very YA to me. It's kind of like... I think... Supposed to be adversarial, kind of, but it's like they talk like they're trying to be friends with one another, I kind think of. that's just bad screenwriting in both of those. Um, right. But I would say more that it's because it's based on a video game and video games take the at least earlier on they took the very simple fantasy narrative which a lot of people do in young adult things the harry potter the hunger games what have you of just like you're the chosen one you're the one who's going to change all right all of the future because in the books you're supposed to be inserting yourself into exactly what i was gonna say yeah and in the video game, you're supposed to be projecting yourself onto whatever character you're playing. Well, it's, yeah, it's sort of like that idea they're encouraging of vicarious identification with a character that is specific to to young adult stuff in the particular way that it achieves that. Like, ostensibly with a lot of stories, you're encouraged to identify with the protagonist. Yeah. But there's something about the way young adult fiction does it that really focuses on that and kind of like 
uses that as a, a as a sort of element of engagement in a way that feels more deliberate and like streamlined. <laughs> There's the laugh that you were looking for. Ooh, I'm gonna mark the time code. Where are we right now? I love that laugh. I gotta get a sound bite of that. Okay, so we're just over 20 minutes in. Yeah. But anyway, I thought that was interesting, and again, it does play in with the idea of this being a video game, and also why this makes me think of superhero stuff. Right, a lot of this cosmology stuff, and also like just the characters themselves, kind of remind me of, you know, the depictions of superheroes. I don't know how they exist in the game. I assume they're way more fleshed out and stuff like that in the later games, in early Mortal right. Kombat games, they weren't really. But, but I feel like, uh, oh my god, that oh, moment, scary skull with a snake going yeah. through. Yeah, that moment was actually inspired by the the famous painting, The Ambassadors, Max. Ah, yes, I know. Uh, you can tell Paul W. Sanderson is. Well, where did Shang Tsung come from? <laughs> yeah, that's why he opened with Shang Tsung staring at people in the beginning because they wanted to alienate you. This was a Brechtian uh, uh, alienation effect moment. Was that skull? I do. That if you've played the video games, that like faint uh, silhouette of like Shang Tsung's skull with the snakes coming out is like a nice little tease for people who like know that's the final like the big bad. Even though he doesn't show up in this movie, he no, should. the Shang Tsung is the guy, not Shang Tsung, Chao Khan. Oh, okay, um, uh, sorry. I wanted to say that, but I keep thinking of Shere Khan, which yeah. is the tiger from <laughs> the Jungle Book. Book. <laughs> yes, Shao Khan is the big bad um, who doesn't show up in this movie and only shows up in the sequel, which I have never made it all the way through because it is, besides a couple of hilariously bad line reads, it's not worth watching at all. But yeah, oh man, this is such a great moment of just seeing them stretch the budget. Yeah, you're like this is like a fan film, but it's so charming. It reminds me of a uh, I don't know if you ever saw it, but before the uh, Studio Power Rangers movie came out, like no, a year before there was like this. <laughs> oh, this scene. Fun fact about this actor: he insisted on doing a lot of his own stunts, and according to the crew, got injured a lot because of it. And I really hope that was one of the scenes he got injured with. Okay, that scene I like. I was just thinking about this in the shower today about that joke in particular. And I'm like all the jokes with his character are so goddamn obvious. Yeah. It's like, it's like a game of chicken. It's like, you can see the joke coming from like a mile away and you're like, they're not actually going to do that. Are they? And no. then they just fucking do it. <laughs> it's like, it's so weird. He's, he's spoiled Hollywood diva man. And every joke about him until the very end of the movie. And even at the end of the movie God. is that, it's like, it's so impossibly obvious. Yeah. It's like, it can't be this obvious. So it comes back around to being like weirdly amusing. I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe this is real. Well, it's kind of just like, I don't know, charming 90s stereotype type <laughs> thing. I don't know. It oh. just, it seems like the minimal effort jokes in every situation. It seems like the minimal effort, but it seems like they put so much effort into making that, like that they're trying so hard to make this shitty joke that it kind of becomes endearing to me. Um, <laughs> look at him dropping his fucking suitcases. Also, why does he like? I get oh, he's the rich Hollywood guy, but why does he need so many suitcases for like? A fu- I don't know, whatever. And, but on the other hand, why didn't? Oh yeah, none of them need baggage. Like she sure. fits everything in her in her uh, turtleneck. Yeah. I and then uh, Luke Kang has uh, some trousers. Yeah, and he has this moment with Katana, who is sitting seductively under an umbrella while the fighters come in for a reason. The idea of that shot is in, is funny, but also I, I like that I enjoy idea. the way this looks. That was a subtle thing before the skull and the thing. Like you saw like statues of warriors from different eras in human history. And if yeah. this tournament does take place every generation, it's just yeah. like, oh, you have like past fighters and statues of them. I like that idea. That's yeah. fun. Um, was this lizard a past fighter? Uh, he's a present fighter. <laughs> Hold on a second question it's a reptile unimportant question because the movie doesn't have an answer for this about the cosmology yeah does it predate human beings um i don't think the mortal because the uh if you want me to say the in-game thing basically there's an evil lord from a different dimension who wants he he's in the business of taking over other dimensions right and raiden the guardian deity of this god knew he was coming for earth realm so he basically petitioned the big yeah the more important gods he's like listen you got to give us a chance uh make it so he has to win 10 mortal Kombat tournaments in a row to do it and the gods are like okay fine that that will be the thing if he wants to conquer you only okay. have to do that so is the, this cosmology like creationist it doesn't acknowledge that humans evolved no. or that there were dinosaurs millions of years ago who care how old I, I don't care i'm just asking because 
I don't care about Mortal Kombat's I told you it was an unimportant question, Max. I told you it was unimportant. Yes, Mortal Kombat, a secret creationist propaganda (laughs) film. Um, God, I wish. I wish church was that interesting. Yeah. I I would read the Bible if it had more to do with Mortal Kombat. Fuck reading the Bible. How about using it as like a A boxing glove? A blunt instrument to be. Yeah. (laughs) And it is kind of sad that they didn't have room for Sub Zero and Scorpion's story because, like, it would have. You would have very much like Boba Fett's. Kind of, of yes. Yeah, except movie. they look stupid, too. <laughs> they look like 90s ninjas, let's be fair. I uh, have to be honest. I think, uh, I, I mean, I think uh, um, Sub Zero looks stupid still. Yeah. Or just basic. But I thought Scorpio looked kind of cool. Scorpion looks good. Yeah, um, some some Scorpion stuff. You mentioned to me before because you said you were looking up characters because you're not familiar with Mortal Kombat and you right. brought up Baraka who is one of the more famous. Oh yeah, he looks cool. Kinda. Fun fact, you know like the little ninja henchman thing? Baraka's from a race in the Mortal Kombat universe that basically serves as like evil cannon fodder. Like whenever Shao Kahn's doing something bad, they're the people that like... Oh, he's like... He's just like a little shit they send out. Uh, his race is, and he's like the best of the little shits. Um, but uh, all of those ninja guys were originally supposed to be Baraka race with like the sharp teeth and the wrist blades. In uh, this movie? Yeah. But then they cut that out because it would have been too much for the budget. And they just oh. made them ninjas. See, I would, be, I would be interested in seeing that. At least one. You could yeah. get at least one Baraka in this. A Tarkatan? Yes. Um, but that would, no, that would have been fun. I, I can see like why you didn't want to go through the trouble of applying prosthetics to all of these fucking extras. I don't know what the production schedule was like for this movie, but clearly they put effort into some things and then some things were sort of left behind. Well, apparently the Goro animatronic uh, costume they were using was just like a fucking nightmare. It required like I don't know how much of an animatronic it is though. It's part costume, part animatronic. Um, It looks like the head is animatronic. But it's two people. But apparently it just kept breaking down. It required like yeah. 16 people to fully operate. It was just like such a fucking pain to deal with. Also, what's the bracket of this tournament like? Because like... I was going to ask you if there were like brackets for this or what was the deal? And what's the point? Like if you're supposed to be defeating Earthrealm's fighters, why are you having one of your dudes fight one of your other dudes? But also, are why are these humans okay with this? Are these humans... Why are the humans like cool Are they? this? I guess. Are are they supposed to be people from the evil dimension? Are they outworlders? It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know why? This movie opened with someone screaming Mortal Kombat. Yes. <laughs> it forgives all sins, Max. Flawless victory. That's the only time in the movie he says that that oh, really? it, it actually makes sense. Oh, okay. No, because he says it a bunch of times in the movie, but like Yeah, but it never makes sense. It's like, well, not really. Well, no, in the in the game, okay, it's a for reference to the game. If you win a round in Mortal Kombat without getting hit, hit once, once by your yeah. opponent, of then, then it's flawless victory. So that is the only time that he says yeah, that. Yeah, other times he says it and it's just like, like not really. No, he got punched a couple of times. Oh, we should pause. We saw him once. We're gonna see him again. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of random weird extras in this movie. Specifically with the clothing. Yeah. And right now we're going to notice a very conspicuous one where a guy is going to walk by with a striped shirt. Yeah, we, he already passed by once. And now he's, doing <laughs> he's walking by the same spot again. He's just some schlubby guy. Um, but it's like, okay, did he just come from like the gap? Yeah. Like what is going on? And Everyone else is wearing like old looking like you know, like outfits that are made specifically for like combat. Yeah. Later on during Sonya's fight against Kano, like the people on Some the of them side, wearing jeans. Yeah. People look like they're on fucking summer vacation. Like, are there like tickets you can buy to witness Mortal Kombat? Yeah. I mean, at least the guy who uh, Johnny Cage is fighting at that point is wearing like pirate trousers. <laughs> also, I guess we'll talk about it when we get to Sonya's fight later, but like Sonya has like the most like, driven character thing like we see her objective we see what she wants to do and then she completes her objective like a third of the way through the movie and has nothing else to do for the rest of it yeah i mean the structure of this movie is just everything about the screenplay is a mess yeah everything i don't think there's a single like really good thing about it no there's not although we haven't mentioned this yet but i think one of the things that also gives us the fan film vibe from this movie is that even though it doesn't accomplish what it's trying to do very well in this in the screenplay you very much feel the beats they're going for and it's almost like the sincerity of their attempt at achieving it it's like you they try so hard that you know in your mind the movie they're going for 
and you can kind of fill in the dots of every scene yeah. of what it's supposed to be. And I think the like a fan film yet again, like it's made by people who like the thing for people who like the thing. Right. So people who liked Mortal Kombat and played it in the arcades, like they they know the general gist of what they're going for and yeah. they'll fill it in based on their personal experiences with it. Um, and I mean, even without having any experience with the game, it's like yeah. I watch this and I think in my mind of like oh, th- he's supposed to be this type of villain character, right? Yeah. Or this is the relationship I think they're going for with the main characters. And I'm kind of like, I understand in my mind. And because it's just not good, but there's still some interesting stuff about it. I'm like, okay, you didn't get there, but you tried really hard. And even though you were nowhere near <laughs> close to accomplishing it, uh, the f- very fact of you trying so much kind of tells me what you were doing. So it's very much a, like an A for effort situation. Yeah. I would say Goro, like, I th- he's the most visually interesting thing in the movie to me. He's I think he's the best defined character, actually. Th- yeah, which is weird to say, because he's Goro. He's, like, in the games, he's always just been muscle before final boss. Like, um... And you said, is did you say he was as articulate in the games? I was curious about that. Um, he, he, well, he always looked odd, because the early Mortal Kombat games were all digitized actors. He, I believe, was a clay figure that they digitized, so he looks, like, distinctly okay. different. From other characters, but yeah, he always he had as much range of motion as an every. No, but I mean, when I say articulate, I mean like verbally. Oh, uh, kind of. Um, in nine and ten, ten he was kind of an auxiliary character, but nine, yeah, he talks quite a bit. Um, because hmm. here's the reason I think he's the best introduced character, and that's because he again looks like a just a jumble of muscles. That would yeah. be the guy before the big boss at the end. He's right? the champ from Pokemon. But here's the thing. He's also speaking about everything very confidently, and he's talking very intelligently about this world that this movie hasn't given us any rules for yet. Yeah, he's, And that's why he feels kind of intimidating, because he feels at home here. Yeah, he's the general of Outworld's armies. He's the yeah. prince of the subterranean empire of the Shokan, and you're just like, oh, these are all things. <laughs> like, right, and he's saying, it, he's saying it, even though uh, Kano doesn't know about any of this, he's yeah. saying it in a way that you can tell he's taking this for granted. Yeah. And it's done in a way where like it, it hammers home the idea that he is threatening, not only because he's physically imposing, but because he knows the rules of this tournament and he's familiar with this world. This is where he's from. This is what he does, right? And I think, like, sort of cleverly, that's kind of the best characterization in the movie because I don't think uh, Shang Tsung is nearly as threatening as No, Goro. I'm, not, I'm never intimidated by Shang Tsung. I'm, like, kind yeah. of just annoyed by him. And, then like, Goro, like, they build up effectively and it's kind of, like... Almost disappointing that Johnny Cage is the one who takes him out and then does nothing for the rest of the movie. Yeah, like, I think... Because the thing is, Shang Tsung is also going to be giving exposition right now to Kano. I mean, just basically talking at him, right? But the thing is, it's not nearly as much of, like, a rhetorical flourish as when, when Goro does it. You know what I mean? Whereas with Goro, we're meeting him for the first time and we're we're learning, like his response to somebody who is like insolent, right. And doesn't know things. Yeah. And everything about, there's no wasted space there. Whereas with Shang Tsung, we've had a number of scenes with him already. Right. And every time he talks to somebody, he just gives them exposition and the way he gives exposition doesn't really tell us a lot about him. Whereas with Goro, it does. You're lining those two (sighs) things. It's sad because like, in the game, Shang Tsung, like, they have an interesting thing. They could have done things, because the reason you can absorb souls is because he was caught cheating in one of the Mortal Kombat tournaments, Ooh. and the gods yeah, cursed him to, like, age rapidly, and the only way he could stay young was steal the souls of everybody he beat in Mortal Kombat. Oh, he's Kombat. like a vampire. Yeah. So, the like, him being young means that, like, he's killed a lot of people and absorbed their souls, which is, like, you could have done, like, a scene where you showed him older and then, like, have it switch to the actor you cast right, right. later on, but... I don't know. You could have done something with that, but he's just sort of scary. Kung Fu again, man. very generic. Yeah. But again, it's so generic that when it fails to even do the generic thing, well, you're like, Oh, I understand what you were going for. Well, that actor actually though, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, uh, what was his name? Carrie Grant. It, no, it's a Carrie hero. Yuki, uh, Tagawa. He was actually also in a uh, Kubo and the two strings. Another movie we've done this podcast. Oh yeah. Okay. He was the, uh, person besides, <gasps> uh, Aside from Paul W. Sanderson, is that the only person that's appeared in two things we've done? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah. uh, Although this also has the weird connection of Jean-Claude Van Damme being sort of involved at the beginning. Yeah, I guess. I, with we, Predator. Yeah. 
I, I need to go back and listen to our Predator episode. Can we get the original Predator outfit as a enemy in Mortal Kombat? <laughs> the little lobster looking thing? Yeah, they're running out of horror movie things to put in the Mortal Kombat game. So yeah, just put original Predator, the orange bug looking. <laughs> or the bye-bye man. Yeah, the bye-bye man in the next Predator, in the next Mortal Kombat game. Oh God, Reptile is something that I'm like, did you really need this character in the movie? Like, yeah, he was in the game, but like whose favorite character was Reptile for one? I know he's popular in the competitive scene now, but like who gives a shit about fucking reptile and the CGI that they use for like the thing that's actually a reptile before it turns into a ninja is fucking awful. Yeah. I don't know that just again, that feels like such a YA moment to me where it's like, why do they care so much that Liu Kang was attacked by this thing? And they're like, are you okay? And also why is he saying like, Oh, I know where, we're, she went this way. I'm like, well, she obviously didn't because there are spider webs in this tomb. Well, like, why do you care in the first place? It doesn't matter. Because they, course, but well, because they heard that the Shang Tsung doesn't want them talking to Katana because it could lead to their defeat. So they're like, I guess we'll go follow, find Katana now. I guess. Um, and now we get... He keeps all these candles lit. That's what I want to know. Yeah, there's a fucking fire hazard here. You know what would be funny is if... Uh, oh, we're also going to get another Mortal Kombat scream do, do, during this do, fight. Do, do. Yeah. There it is. Oh my god! This is this uh, a, a good time to mention that the choreography in this is not movie is not the best? Yeah, which is <laughs> they just jump over him for no yeah. reason. Which is kind of it's sad. very slow. Like you could have really done something with this. You know that uh, Cameron Diaz was originally going to be so. Yeah, yeah so I read that, and then I think she got busy on the mask. No, they they cast her because of the mask. Oh, actually, okay. um, mask was made in what ninety four came out. She 94. gets a really good introduction in that movie. But, um, yeah, no, that's why they cast her. But, uh, I think she injured herself during the filming of this movie. Oh, shit. Ow. And, and had to bow out. But the actress, um, they have playing her really wanted to do it. And she had just finished up the movie that she had scheduling conflicts with. So they hired her immediately, which good for her. But, like, yeah. I mean, I think, honestly, I think her, uh, choreography is the worst. Yeah. If I had to choose well, one, but you know, the, it is what it is. You know, they, she actually had to learn the choreography and fight scenes during the filming of the movie. That's unfortunate. Yeah. That's hard. So I, I'm not going to entirely blame her. And like, it's not like anybody's choreography in this movie is amazing. So I'm not going to fault her too much for it. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to talk about the uh, casting I wish this movie had. Where the dream version of this 90s movie in my mind. Um, can, can you imagine if they, like, if Brandon Lee had survived to be in this movie you had john claude van damme as let me finish this okay you had john claude van damme as johnny cage and you had cameron diaz as sonia blade like imagine how it would be more of a cult movie for sure i'm not sure because this movie's already like quite a bit of a cult movie like people still talk about this surprisingly um i'm pretty sure 95 percent for the theme song but uh (laughs) um it would be so like this was the era where, like, because, like, a lot of video game movies now, you just have, like, shitty actors, shitty roles, nobody cares. Um, but, like, you'd have, like, these three big <laughs> actors in this fucking Mortal Kombat movie. Well, here's what I was thinking for the casting. It's not Brandon Lee. It's not Jean-Claude Van Damme. First of all, with this guy's lines, I gotta mean, be Bruce Campbell. It's gotta be Bruce Campbell. <laughs> You think he wouldn't class that shit right up without I changing the dialogue at all? But you saying his lines like that, like I'm just imagining John Claude Van Damme with his fucking accent saying Johnny Cage's lines and like, oh God. Bruce Campbell would surpass Jean Claude Van Damme, no joke. And you could actually make a joke of him actually faking all his action scenes and not knowing how to fight. Yeah. But here's the thing Bruce Campbell, you could get creative with that because he's a great slapstick actor, right? Yeah. Evil Dead 2, one of the great slapstick performances in all of film. People mm-hmm. don't talk about him as a good physical comedian, but he is. And you pair him with another great physical comedian and slapstick performer, Jackie Chan. <laughs> right? You got Jackie Chan and Bruce Campbell in this movie. It, you can't take it seriously, right? But think about how much fun it would be to watch them do a thing. And then I guess I can't think of somebody off the top of my head to play Sonya Blade, but Cameron Diaz certainly would have charisma for that. I think if you had them three, that would be fantastic. That'd be great casting for this movie. Yeah. I, I, that's like, imagine being like, oh yeah, I was in the Mortal Kombat movie and got injured on set. Like, I don't know. It's like, oh, well, at least you still have your spine. Yeah. I don't know. I just think 
it's unfortunate that there's not like an actor that really brings any of these roles to life apparently in a big way apparently chris lambert was like the production favorite both uh, well his performance is the most provocative and strange i don't know if we've mentioned it i mean it's it's bad yeah but also it's like he's so confidently going into the bad weird decision he's making that is totally inexplicable to talk that way he's he's diving into it so like steadfastly that it's kind of like weirdly like mesmerizing but apparently paul ws anderson said chris lambert was like a huge easy because this was his first major movie and apparently because chris lambert had already worked on a bunch of bigger hollywood movies he like you mean like highlander 2 the quickening <laughs> yes of course but um he was like a big calming presence and helped him get used to the process and ed boone the one of the co-creators of mortal Kombat, said that he was his favorite role from this movie even though he was a white guy and not asian even though i i guess because raiden is a japanese it's based on a japanese word and he's supposed to be the shaolin god of lightning for this movie but yeah, I would say he is the most memorable performance in this movie, whether that's good acting or not. It's certainly a decision. It, he's making. it, it is a decision. Yeah. We can say that. So, oh, jeans, look. Yeah. <laughs> the people in the background. Oh, my God, the extras. Jeans. So many jeans. Why? Guys, just cheer. Don't worry about it. It won't dwell on you too long. The weird thing is that are those people wearing jeans supposed to be? That guy's wearing a vest. Yeah. Are they oh, supposed yeah. to be from like the human world or like? I I don't know what Ed Boon looked like in the nineties, but I like I keep looking back for, <laughs> to be like, is one of these people Ed Boon? Oh, you mean just like cameos? Yeah, cameos. Because like yeah, then I would understand of just be like, oh okay, the creators wanted a cameo and they didn't feel like changing outfits for the day. But it's not just like that. It's like yeah. there are so many people wearing like. <laughs> Like normal earth clothes. Your soul is mine. He's not dead yet. This isn't Mortal Kombat. He's still alive. But now he's not. He's going to get a blue filter on him. Um. No, but he's... Okay, I guess if they take your soul, are you dead? Can you get your soul back? It looks like uh, some of the people who are warriors in this... Who are combatants in this tournament are people who are just like they're dead, but their souls are like released again or whatever. Yeah, but then they go to an afterlife question mark, and he doesn't take Katana's soul. I'm assuming because it would get him in shit with his boss. But uh, <laughs> if he took his adopted daughter's soul, but, which uh, also doesn't make sense, her motivations. But whatever. Well, yeah, because they decided they didn't have time to explain her motivations. It's weird to to have a movie that is so like convoluted and like utterly without explanation in terms of its plot motivations and character motivations and then be so ready to just be like, well, I don't care. Yeah. Cause the movie clearly doesn't care either, <laughs> but it does care about something. I guess that's the difference. It cares about something. It doesn't care about the plot. And actually when we were doing the preview, <laughs> I made the, uh, perhaps slightly blasphemous, uh, comparison with this movie, uh, in comparing the experience of watching it to maybe something like the big sleep <laughs> where that's a classic noir movie, right? Which is clearly much better than this movie. And it's very convoluted, right? And you can't quite follow it from scene to scene while you're watching it, even though that movie makes more sense than this one <laughs> when you do break it down. Uh, but the thing is, the movie is so interested in just doing like the character things in each scenario it puts them in that it doesn't matter. And the plot being convoluted is part of that equation. If it wasn't that convoluted, it wouldn't be as interesting of a movie, I don't think. Yeah, and then this is the part where I'm just like, I get that like you have one bad for each of our three main characters. Like you have Kano for Sonya, you have right. Moro for Johnny Gage, and you have Shang Tsung for, yeah, fucking Liu Kang. But this leaves Sonya with nothing to do but randomly be a damsel in distress, which is something that she's never been in the games. And it's kind of like, yeah. Ugh. Um, and also, like, Shang Tsung is weirdly flirting with her the entire movie. Well, he's weirdly infatuated with her. Yeah. We were talking about this, too, before, where it's like, he, I, as he goes out of his, his way to get Johnny Cage as yeah. well, but he really goes out of his way to get her because he apparently organized this entire operation and hired Kano for the sole purpose of... Convincing her to come, even though Raiden By already, killing her partner. Yeah, even though Raiden already wanted her as one of the warriors, apparently. It's uh, very weird. Yeah. So he's... Some somewhat strangely infatuated. Yeah, and then when Sony Kano, Blade. then Kano was like, "Ooh, maybe we should get, oh, we should have our own room together." And he's like, "Oh, you're not gonna touch her, or I'll get you a seeing eye dog, yeah. Kano." 
Oh, and as you know, if you're doing, if you're barely holding a handstand and have your legs haphazardly wrapped around somebody's neck, you automatically win the fight. Well, Max, women's legs are indestructible. Don't you know this? Oh, yeah. Do it. I was genuinely surprised. I remember being like, because this movie's like, it's notorious for like not having a lot of violence in it. Right. Because it's based off of fucking Mortal Kombat, a game where you were. Maybe that's just the contrast. Because again, she does she break fucking, that guy's neck. Yeah, break his neck with his legs. Um, oh, is this the beginning of the sequence of scenes? I guess it was when when uh, Johnny Cage was fighting, or no, when Liu Kang was fighting the guy earlier with the pole. But yeah. like, we haven't talked about it yet, but the movie now is just going into sequences. Oh, here's a fight. Here's another fight. Is there an explanation? Well, no, here's another fight. Yeah. Like what is happening now? Why is Scorpion challenging him in the middle of this woods somewhere? Yeah. And that's, and I guess it looks kind of cool. That's Ed Boon. I knew the moment he said that, that there was something from a video game. Well, yeah. That he says all the time. And that's always been a fun little cameo is that Ed Boon does the come, yeah, get over here and come here lines for, scorpion which he still does to this day um scorpion really fucked up though he didn't know that this would happen yeah i mean scorpion should have won this fight like 80 times it's just that johnny cage happens to get lucky with his surround he gets really lucky he finds a shield to block the by the way how does he escape from hell uh yeah that's that's (laughs) That's a really good i didn't think about that until now also uh it's fun little uh cinema sins bullshit thing but it was funny to see cars in the background of the shot too well, I don't think that's cinema sinsy. I just think it's funny. That, I mean, like, we don't care. We're not going to ding the movie for it. No, but like, yeah, if you notice in the background at some point, there are, you can clearly <gasps> see like a parking lot and a road and some cars. Look at the digital effect. I do like the hell set though. It's fun. Yeah, uh, it's fun. And it was funny realizing the reason they don't have fire is because it's made of <laughs> really flammable wood. wood. And also, but also like fake cobwebs off of everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I guess, God. like, in the context of Mortal Kombat, this is supposed to be the nether realm, but, like, yeah. It just, it's a high school gymnasium, Max, and they yeah. just had some wood. It's, and they're like, let's do something. It's a high school with haunted it. house in the gym. Like, yeah. Oh, God. I just love that they decided to do that for. That, that shot, when you analogize this to be like a high school or a college film, like that shot where, like, you pan over and then pan back and he's there, that's like a shot I did in a music video in college, and I was super proud of that I got it. To work, well, again, so. that's like a go to move yeah. for any sort of horror surprise moment, yeah. right? But, like, if you do it with enough enthusiasm, sometimes you can actually get away with doing stuff like that. Yeah, choreography isn't terrible there. Um, Honestly, this is probably the most creative set. Not that I think the other ones look like shit, but it's just weird. You don't expect to go to like some weird realm where it's like there's just wooden ladders and shit everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> what if they went through another portal and they just went to the MC Escher staircase at the end of Labyrinth and started fighting there? Started fighting David Bowie. Yes. That's the fun thing about thinking about this game and specifically like the idea of fatalities because you just imagine different people throughout life and you're like, what would their fatality be? <laughs> I know we were joking earlier that Steven Spielberg should have a character in Mortal Kombat and that his fatality might be like throwing a mechanical shark at people. <laughs> um, but what are some other ones, right? Like what would be Jareth's <laughs> one? Would he turn into an owl at you? It'd like th- He'll do the contact juggling. <laughs> <laughs> just fucking like... <laughs> or just throw glitter at you? He, he hits you with his bulge and your skull just cracks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. That's what it has to be is the bulge. Well, normally characters have one or two fatalities at the very least. So right. But we, that would be the best one. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. We, we can have, we already acknowledged in the pre-discussion that we could have uh, Orson Welles be a, a different skin for a yes. ride show. Um, for Orson awesome. Welles as Paul Masson. Yeah. Just drinking a lot and... <laughs> doing his champagne commercial would his uh fatality be something like he'll he'll make you really upset and panicked because he'll tell you the martians are invading over the radio <laughs> they do have silly fatalities like that um mm-hmm. sometimes where it's just like why well, okay whatever um well oh and then we have the we have this which is is, is this the only fatality that is like quoted in the movie um 
directly, yeah. Um, it's a very specific one. Yeah, right? and they had to because like you have to get the skull with the fire. Honestly, it was a very like strange, surreal experience to see him take off the like the human mask and it's just like a like a, a skull. skull and I'm like what like because it's not that it happens it's that it's so matter of fact the way he does it and if you're gonna also, have, he's got a great death he does but like he's if, got blood if you're gonna say that like if you're gonna have Raiden telling Johnny Cage that he needs to get over his ego and like that's like how he's going to win Mortal Kombat he never does like he ends this fight by throwing an autographed picture on top of Scorpion's corpse. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious. But, like, just the fact that that is the way it ends is hilarious. Yeah. Like, I can't believe that they, like, there's no other explanation. No questions asked. I'm just going to do this, and now I'm going to walk out of hell, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long walk back. Yeah. But anyway, I forget what we were talking about. Orson Welles and his uh, fatalities. Yeah. He, oh, I, or whether or not that was the only fatality they literally sort of took for the movie. I love how they didn't even fucking dare to try to have Katana's actual costume. Is it really like... I think I showed it to you. It's just fucking gratuitous and dumb. I was actually... Because I'm dumb. I'm on the internet looking at, like, trailers and information for the new Mortal Kombat. And there's a character who... And yet another character who started off as a palette swap. Okay. Of Katana. Um, same kind of skimpy outfit. Red. It's a female ninja who can control blood. Scarlet. She's in the new one. And they completely redid her outfit. It's much more covering. It like actually looks like something like in a ninja assassin. Something would that would actually keep you safe yeah. from anything. Yeah. Um, and I like it. I think it looks really good. I like. I played Scarlet in Mortal Kombat 9 and I was always kind of like annoyed that her outfit looked like that. But I liked the idea of this blood controlling ninja. Is like it like a two piece situation? Um, here, I'll show it to you and we can hear your live reaction okay. to fucking Katana. I'm sure it'll be underwhelming, so don't get your hopes up, anybody. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we just missed the scene where she very subtly... Use the... She gives him the cheat code to beat the next level of Mortal Kombat. Um, yeah. I think I showed this In to you. In a way that nobody else would be able to tell. Oh, yeah, you did show that to me. Yeah. But, um... I mean, her boots cover a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, I understand. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you... Or like that. like. Oh, wow, that's even more crazy. Okay. That's like the thing I was thinking of with like the Wonder Woman outfit. Just seeing like Gal Gadot in that outfit. I'm like, you're walking... Like, wow. Like, it takes a lot to be able to do that in front of a camera in a big budget movie. Like, I don't know. But I can appreciate too that they didn't do something like really outlandishly stupid for that. Because then it would be annoying... Because you're like, it's very deliberately directing your gaze towards them in a way that would just be dumb. Yeah. Also, oh, here we have clever Raiden with the water. <laughs> yeah, very clever of just literally leaving water in the middle of the arena. Did he overhear Katana's hint <laughs> earlier as well? I was going to make a joke earlier that if Raiden wanted to be a dick, he'd just dump the water he has on all those candles. <laughs> he'd just go around the entire castle being like, oops. <laughs> gotcha again. Lao Sung. Lao Sung, that's my favorite Mortal Kombat character. That's his name, right? <laughs> yep. Just keep saying that. Um, yes, exactly. Um, you should go back in time and get a business and yeah, get a job in the scat industry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what makes you think I don't? I'll have to look, look you up for that or whatever your pseudonym was back in the day. Um, have I ever mentioned that... Cause I know you're not a big Disney fan, but you've seen all the old Disney movies. Um, yeah. Uh, you never had a friend like me, Aladdin, with Robin Williams doing scat as a genie. No, I don't remember that. The uh, only thing I remember from that movie is the most horrifying lyric from any Disney song is when uh, they're flying on the magic carpet and Aladdin goes, don't you dare close your eyes. <laughs> I always rem like, remember feeling weird that he actually likes it. I understand what he's trying to say, but it's like, dude. Oh, I thought you were going to make a reference that the song Arabian Nights has not aged that well. But, um, oh, I mean, in general, <laughs> no. But also that lyric, weirdly to me, like freaked me out as a kid. It's yeah. like, what? You, what? You're going to say that to somebody you like? I just Don't you dare close your eyes. <laughs> I just had, no, because apparently there's like hours of Robin Williams doing scat. For that, <laughs> for that <laughs> really? Song. Wow, okay. Which I would love to hear. Um, they actually really wanted him badly for that movie to the point where they... Um, 
took Robin Williams' stand-up and they did animation having Genie performing the stand-up. Oh, that's fun. Because they really wanted him for that role. That's fun. It worked out well. He was great. Um, oh, by the way, Mortal Kombat. Yeah. For We're not the only ones who forgot. Liu Kang forgot as well. That's mm-hmm. why he's just standing there while... Scorpion's doing his ice barrier. Uh, move. Scorpion, Sub-Zero Max, Sub-Zero. Oh my God, I'm the worst. But he's basically creating like a... <laughs> like an atomic bomb <laughs> right on his belt buckle and he's just standing there. Also, this is just, this is like the dumbest thing. Yeah, it is. Water! I get it. Water! <laughs> and it throwing an empty bucket That's that has not no... Empty. Look, there's no water coming out of it. I don't care what you have to say. Centrifugal force, I man. knew you were going to say that. It doesn't matter. It's empty. Uh, and then Katana just shows up and it's like, wait, does she have telepathy? It'd make more sense if he just heard the words but then she looks at him and says it and it's like wait is she saying that i don't know yeah it if, doesn't matter if she's gonna say that why didn't she just throw the match originally and then show up to his match and to that why didn't she just say water <laughs> he was fucking water you idiot yeah hey goro there you are buddy at least they had the sense to sort of save goro a little bit well if they're going off the game they have to because yet again he's always the guy right before the final boss right and then he gets to endlessly throw these guys around for a bit. Yeah, we thought it was th- fun uh, how how many times they actually do this. Yeah. <laughs> they do this like 40 times. <laughs> Just going through every crew member. Like, who wants to get thrown by Goro next? Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Also, they should have had Steven Spielberg in a cameo for this. Wouldn't yeah. that be hilarious? Outworld must be doing shitty in this tournament. Because, like, if those are all Earthrealm people, then they lost every single round. Well, we don't know the bracket. We no. don't know how far along they are. Yeah, but if I'm assuming that, like, because they don't have to fight anybody else, so I'm assuming that, like, yeah. Outworld just well, did also shitty in this like, tournament. it's, hard to tell who is a representative of, of which realm. Yeah. That guy's wearing plaid. Do you see that? Yeah. Well, well anyway. Looks like he's try- like, trying to obnoxiously hit on... Wait, is that Liu Kang? Is Liu Kang wearing plaid? No, that's not Liu Kang. That's someone else. Well, because Sonya and Johnny were sitting next to it's it. It's not Art Lean. Oh, Art. It's hilarious that we are introduced to Art Lean and then we literally don't see him until now. Until he has to die. Yeah. God damn it. I still think, like, and I know you can't rip a character's arm off, arms off in a PG-13 movie. But, is that uh, challenge? Yeah. Well, I you'll find a, a movie that... Yeah, no, but the guy in plaid standing next to Sonya Blade looked like she was trying... He was trying to, like, fucking chatter up, and she was just like, that's my friend, obviously. And then Johnny Cage was like, hey, that's what I'm doing. I'm supposed to hit on her when but she out. doesn't want it. But out, buster. And as I've said before, they're... Because they get married in the game and then get divorced, but uh, their kid is one of the more interesting, fleshed-out characters. God, that is so YA. I ne- ne- never think I uh, finished making my point about this in terms of, the like, the YA vicarious enjoyment thing yeah and connecting that to the idea of superheroes and like superheroes being very much a part of that power fantasy that works very much in line with this and this being more even like fertile grounds for exploring that type of story because it's literally adapted from a video game yeah which is the most the closest you can get to that being actually the case with any sort of text right you stepping into the shoes of a character so even more so than superheroes Maybe a Mortal Kombat movie is perhaps a better vehicle for exploring that type of storytelling. Well, okay. Can I bring up one of the reasons I chose this movie now? Yeah, do it. Um, One of the things I wanted to talk about is Hollywood, for many, many years, mainly driven by money, has tried to adapt... Sorry, Austin was making quite a face there. Um, I was yawning, and then you caught me, and I started (laughs) making a weird face. Um, But... They've adapted many, many video game franchises into movies and other media as well. But like, they're all bad. Like video games specifically. Video game movies are almost always fucking terrible. I can't think of like, people just be like, oh, well, I grew up with the first Pokemon movie. That was sad. Go watch the first Pokemon movie now. You were five years old when you watched it. It's not that sad. I'm sorry. Also, I don't consider that as much of an adaptation because... Wasn't Pokemon a show anyway? Yeah, and it was it an was. anime. It's not like a live action movie. No, it was an anime. But yeah. still, like in general, they're always right. bad. And well, Max, have you seen Doom? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
But why? <gasps> why are they always bad? What is it about video games? Like, and you can always make the argument that it's just out of touch studio people not understanding the property they're getting, and that's why it's bad. But like, right? Is that it? Because you can't like, as developers have proven over the years, like you can take a simple com a prom yeah premise like Mortal Kombat, a game that had very small story that was like written in paragraphs on the side of the machine right and at the end when you beat the game and make it a compelling story with characters you actually care about the more recent mortal kombat games have had very in-depth sure. involved stories yeah why is it that movies can't seem to do well that? in terms of the production what you said is right it's yeah. that people see video games and they they're old enough where it's like the only thing they think of when you say video game is pong yeah. Right. And that's what they'll always think of or like Donkey Kong or something. And that is what they think video games are. And they're not going to take it seriously. And I think you could say that for a number of different things. Right. And I'm sure it's changing now. It's slightly, right. I was going to bring that up. Um, Netflix recently. This is slightly different because it's not live action. OK. But um, the Castlevania series is on Netflix. Um, it's an animated show. Uh, did a three episode first season. Then uh much more episodes for the second season. A lot of people in the gameosphere are proclaiming that is the best adaptation of a video game in any form of other media ever. And I'm kind of inclined to agree with them. Like it takes the themes of what made Castlevania great to begin with. And then fleshes out the characters in ways that they weren't necessarily fleshed out in the games, but you find believable in the context of the universe they're building, which is kind of a risk. I wish the movies were willing to take in a good way, not just like disregard your source material like Paul W.S. Anderson's Resident Evil movies do, but like you acknowledge and find out why people like the universe that you're adapting and then expand on that rather than either ignore it or limit yourself to solely your source material. Right. Well, also, I think part of the thing is, and you were talking about this, if we're going to, aside from just story decisions that I think you mentioned in our conversation about this earlier, part of the thing that you sort of question in terms of adapting a video game and how you would go about doing it successfully is what makes something successful as a video game are often like the mechanics of it. Yes. And it's how do you take the mechanics of a video game and the way that you engage with the mechanics of a video game and turn that experience into something that you can understand in cinematic terms because you're not going to be engaging with it the same way. And I know this is a conversation we've had multiple times where, you know, I don't, I'm not like an expert on video games, but there are some I really enjoy specifically doom, I think is the coolest thing ever. Oh, the new doom game. Yeah. It's right. fucking amazing. But if you were going to adapt a video like that game, which I think you could, you would have to do it in a really ballsy way because it would have to be as visceral as something as like the Texas chainsaw massacre but also as elegant as like the red shoes. You would have to have the violence be very fast and sort of elegant, like a ballet dance sequence. And also you would have to have the punches hit home very hard and it would have to feel sort of like it has an edge, even though I hate that word. So the thing is you have to do something that formally in terms of the way you're shooting your movie is so dramatic and specific that you really would have to put a lot of thought into it for every video game beforehand right and uh otherwise you're gonna be adapting it in the same way you might as well just be adapting a book or something yeah and that's the thing well you have people complain about movie adaptations of books a lot because it's like oh well you missed this part in the book and it's like well well movie is a movie yeah movie has different strengths than literature it's always the same question right yes uh what does one medium do well that another doesn't do as well and vice versa I love how like this moment is supposed to be like Shang Tsung is like tricking him, but it doesn't amount to anything other than 15 wasted minutes of them wandering throughout. world. Yeah. I mean, this movie is too long, which is weird to say, cause it's an hour and 40 minutes long, but I don't know. I think a lot of movies it's like, I guess 90 minutes for me is the demarcation point where it's like 90 minutes to me is like, what makes it a movie? Anything shorter than that. I'm just like, I don't trust the movie <laughs> at that point. No, no. I guess, I don't know, maybe I'm just at a different point, but it's just like, I, I feel like I always wonder if like a movie could be done in 90 minutes. And sometimes the answer is just yes, even if it's a good movie and like this movie somehow maybe a little bit too long, but also if you can't think of a part to cut out, then I think 
you should take that into consideration when you judge a movie by its length by its length. But yeah, like well, this movie, you could cut tons of stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on now? Uh, Raiden is like, like he's do it playing like 3D chess because like he's pretending that he's objecting to Shang Tsung who's pretending that he's tricking Johnny Cage into challenging Goro and then he's provoking Johnny Cage. But apparently that's what Raiden wanted all along because he smiles right here because now he knows that he's going to beat Goro. <laughs> so Raiden is a fucking uber genius to manipulate all of these people at once into doing what he wants to happen. Okay. <laughs> or it's just Chris Lambert smirking because it's just like I'm in the Mortal Kombat movie. Or it could just be Raiden smirking because he thinks he's really smart. Yeah. Wouldn't it be hilarious to have somebody who is like, who's just so self-satisfied with all their shit that they have no idea that's what's going on. But no matter the situation, they think they've... They're two steps ahead of everybody. Well, that's kind of the plot of Mortal Kombat 9 is like Raiden trying to change the events of the future and constantly fucking up and making it worse for Stop everybody. doing it. <laughs> oh, Goro. We all love you. Also, like, Johnny Cage's plan is to lure him to a, a small ledge and kick him off. And say, this is where you fall. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. He even takes his glasses off dramatically. Yeah. You can tell those didn't crush him like, in the way they wanted them <laughs> to. They just kind of bent. It would have been great if Goro put them on. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be okay with that costume. These are my glasses and That now. is DLC costume. Please. Yeah, also, like, what if he, like, dropped down and hid in the balls and he's just like, how do you know my physiology? Like, I. Yeah, I was wondering about that, too. Yeah, because, like, it makes sense because that's one of Johnny Cage's iconic moves in the game. Although it's weird that's the first thing he tried. Is Where like, is it? I don't know. Well, no, that's, like, his iconic thing. So, like, they had to do it in that thing. And it does work on Goro in the game, so why not? But, like, I think it would be funny if he just, like, he had done that to a different fighter. Like, if, mm. the, if we're taking these characters and making a new Maybe move. he just assumes because he has four arms, he has four balls. Yeah. <laughs> you're, like, you're twice as vulnerable. They've never done that, actually. I Because they there are things called x-ray moves where you can see, like, the, in, like the bones <laughs> and the stuff. And in Mortal Kombat 10, there are, like, a lot of ball punch moves that, like, you can see somebody's balls getting fucking mangled. But Goro, unfortunately, does not have four balls. Missed well, opportunity. species procreate? There are female ones of him. You can. There is a female uh, oh. one, of, one of Goro's species. Is there a called Shiva? But is um, there a uh, played her in Mortal Kombat? Is there a, uh, a cougar version of him? There. Oh, there's a tiger version of him. Okay, uh, Kintaro. He was the second. He was like he took his place in uh, Mortal Kombat two because Goro was supposed to have been killed by Luke Kang. So it's mm, just like okay. Uh, we're uh, same boss, but he's a tiger and can shoot fire now. Question mark. Well, okay. Yeah. Those were shitty five hundred dollars sunglasses. If they just fucking bent and broke instantly. You mean when Agoro crushed them? <laughs> you should make an ad for whatever sunglasses <laughs> you really enjoy wrapping, and you're like, these wouldn't break when Goro crushed them. Yeah, exactly. Oh, poor Goro. There goes the last character I care about in this movie. <laughs> this is where you fall down. Yeah, they, that's a reference when Goro fights Johnny Cage in Mortal Kombat 10. They reference this scene in the movie, um, which is funny because the movie's non-canon, but obviously all video game movies are. And Sonya, why are you suddenly help? Remember you killed a man with your thighs earlier in the movie? Well, he's pulling her hair, Max. Oh, yeah. All women are instantly rendered helpless the second you grab their ponytail. That's a well-known fact yeah, of exactly. physiology. Yeah, exactly. It's just like uh, the the aliens from Avatar. You pull their hair and they're helpless. I thought you pulled their hair and it's like jerking them off. Oh. <laughs> well, that too. That's why they're helpless. <laughs> oh, I can't do anything. I'm immobilized. Oh, I, I still can't believe that. Like, there's theoretically like five more sequels to Avatar. In Not production. theoretically. I think they finished shooting them. No, I think they. I think they began production of the second one. I um, don't know. I don't know. Who cares? Sam Worthington is going to die before they finish doing those. Who's like excited about that? There was somebody talking. No one. 
There's the James Cameron. The most popular uh, fan fiction website on the internet at the moment is an archive of our own or AO3. Um, and somebody posted, it's like, I can't think of a more damning condemnation of Avatar than the fact that there are like 23 original fan fictions for it, whereas just like other so much like more obscure or less popular things have like thousands upon thousands of fan fictions written See, that's there. strange to me because I would anticipate that people would write some strange fix. Some self-insert erotic fix for that. Yeah. Because, I mean, they deliberately, you know, sexed up those aliens too, yeah. right? So, you know, he definitely made it thinking that some people would do that yeah, but too. That'd be, no. uh, maybe it's just his dream. And originally he posted a number that was higher, but then he's like, actually I looked and uh, a lot of that was mistagged uh, Avatar The Last Airbender <laughs> fan fiction. So it's By like, the way, uh, you mentioned fan fiction. Yes. We mentioned this being kind of like a fan film. I'm sure there's lots of strange fan fiction of Mortal Kombat, yeah? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I was actually surprised because I was looking up, because Tumblr's a great place for fan art. Um, I was actually surprised to see that like the gender ratio for Mortal Kombat fans is much more evenly split than I thought it would be. Hmm. I'm happy about that. Um, and, I'm, and I guess that I knew there was young female, like women grew up with this because uh, Sonya Blade, actually, her new voice actress is a professional fighter, Ronda Rousey, in the new game. No, that's cool. Um, and she was talking about how like, <laughs> and I knew she's a fan. She like had cosplayed bef- as her before. Um, and she's talking about how, like she played him on the ar- yeah played her on the arcades when she was little, which is fun. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's it's good to see. I'm happy that people of all genders and creeds and races can enjoy ripping people's fucking heads off together. That's what will bring us together as a species as mortal fucking combat. I'm punching the CGI lizard. Obviously, you know, it is also weird about this movie, although it's only in, I think, this sequence with the reptile, yeah. which real bad luck to throw him into that thing, I guess. Yeah, the thing that will turn him into a green ninja for some reason. It could have thrown him anywhere else. It would have been fine. But anyway, I think this movie is also weird because it's one of those 90s CGI movies where it's like there you have characters interacting with CGI, but also it's like before actors like like, knew how to do that right you have the fucking random see that's the thing like the Shao Kahn voice going reptile um who is again just the same shit as Scorpion and Sub-Zero he is no but he was literally originally a palette swap um in the later games they did turn him into like a humanoid reptile thing that spits acid and I think this might be my favorite fight though just in the way it's shot the lighting is fun and interesting. It's better than the final fight with Shang Tsung, which is kind of boring right. and goes on. But for also too long. the way the the shots interact with the choreography, it doesn't look quite as slow as the other ones. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I this don't know. This is the thing where, like, if Brandon Lee had been in this movie, or Brandon Lee had been in this movie, like, I feel like it could have carried on a lot better on his fighting talent. Sure, I don't know. Whoever the fuck this guy is. Well, I don't think it's necessarily this guy's fault at being bad. It's just Brandon Lee has experience filming action. Filming while fighting. I'm sure they got great people for like just creating a choreography for this stuff. Yeah. It's just, you know, when you have somebody who has not shot a movie that is like very much built on action set pieces, this is like a real challenge to direct, you know? I can imagine. Yeah, I'm not... I am taking for granted how like hard it is to film convincing action scenes. Yeah. Um, because it's not merely a question of like, okay, what are the angles I'm choosing to actually have it like visually make sense what's happening, but also how am I cutting it and shooting for the edit in terms of the, when they're making contact with one another and edit it together in a way that it looks like a continuous fight and people can tell what the fuck is going on. And yeah. It's challenging, you know? And also like, it, unless you're actually going to like really lean into like the mizzen scene of it, which I don't even know if you totally would be allowed to legally, honestly, <laughs> depending on the situation where you just had people really swinging at, at each other, which you could do if like people were like revved up enough to do that. I mean, actors commit to roles, right? Yeah. But like you'd have to have two talented martial yeah. artists. It's a really d- specific type of sequence and scene 
to try to shoot and make look really cinematic. So well, we had talked about before how like the fight in hell with Scorpion earlier was like one of the more entertaining ones to watch. Um, Although I think that's more because of the set piece. True. But like also Scorpion's doing some cool shit. Oh, uh, that's, he actually showed up to play a ninja, that actor. And they were actually so impressed with his, uh, fighting on camera that they just hired him to play fucking Scorpion, which why not? He doesn't have any spoken lines that aren't already pre-recorded, and sure, it's not like you need him to look any specific way other than have human eyes until he takes off his mask. Yeah, although I think the difference—he's oogie boogie, it's filled with bugs. You made the same joke, and I'm going to make the same joke. Halloween three mask. Hey, <laughs> he watched Halloween three, or he was one of the children. I still like Halloween, Halloween three. three. So do I. That movie gets a lot of shit from dumb people. But. Do you think that rich white guy's finishing move from that movie would be like, he's going to put a mask on you and turn your head into bugs? Yeah. In, in Mortal Kombat 15, when they've actually run out of horror movie characters. To <laughs> Just that horror. rich white guy who stole a piece from <laughs> Stonehenge. Yeah. Just that guy. And it'll be, uh, that'll be the plot too. Because I already see it. I already see people being like, oh, put Chucky or put uh, Pennywise in the next Mortal Kombat. What? I'm like... Don't. I mean, Chucky would be kind of amusing. I just want to hear the vocal performance. Listen, I love horror movies. I really do. Like, they're my favorite genre of movie, and I've seen so many of them. But, like, stop it. The reason that, like, a lot of these monsters are scary is because, like, they're unstoppable killing machines. And, like, that's the reason that, like, Michael Myers works. It's the reason that Jason works. Right. Well, I mean, I don't think you would want to add them as like playable to, to be character. scary it's just yeah. it's pure fan service it's like I oh i like this thing i want to fight with them it's kind of gratuitous i i get it like from yeah. a marketing standpoint it gets people who n- wouldn't normally play your game excited in your game and gets them to buy copies well vice versa too yeah no it's good it's it's beneficial for both companies involved and especially since warner brothers owns mortal Kombat now like they can use it as to promote whatever fucking thing that they have in their repertoire. But also it's kind of gratuitous to just see the nerd fan favorites yeah. over and over. Like it'd be way more interesting if they actually pulled from like weird, like precedent sources. So like, what if they had like, what if they pulled from like, uh, uh, like Inferno or something and they had somebody who like, like what if they had like <laughs> Ulysses from Inferno or something like you had to fight Odysseus oh my God. or some shit like that. Right. Wouldn't that be weird? Or like Achilles comes back something from like a strange source you wouldn't expect, but kind of would be at home with the idea of this tournament. You I, know what I mean? I guess. Yeah. There, there is like a whole unexplored thing. Cause like they never have addressed in the Mortal Kombat games. Cause like that you just sort of take for granted that earth has lost the last nine tournaments in a row. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to mention that some, some point of too. the warriors from, from that. And they take place over a long period of time, right? Yeah, I think the thing... You could do a whole Bill and Ted situation. Yeah, like you meet all of them. Um, Socrates. <laughs> Socrates was a fighter for Earth, which is why we lost. <laughs> <laughs> he just tried to phil- philosophize at them. Fucking, oh my God. Um, you don't understand. There's this you? comic where it's a guy just being like... Fuck Socrates. I don't know anything either, but you don't see me bragging about it. And it, then he just looks down and he has a banner on him now that says Socrates 2.0. He's like, God damn. <laughs> yeah. Although, uh, of course, the funny thing about that is that Socrates never wrote that shit down. So yeah. you just talk about it, then other people bragged about it for him. Yeah. Well, I, hey, if you talk so much and annoy everybody so much that they want you to commit suicide, then... Yeah, it's cr- <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that that is how, like, Western philosophy, like, the tradition of it, like, solidly begins is with somebody who was so pedantic and annoying <laughs> <laughs> that they that wanted the, to kill that, him. That the government <laughs> ordered him to kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> and no one took the lesson from that. Oh, God. Oh my god! I guess that's his finishing move. He's gonna annoy you so much. Is sec- <laughs> this is Shang Tsung's finishing move? Is sexual harassment? Yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> Socrates, I'm gonna do battle with the Socratic method. Yeah. Fight, but why? Why are you fighting? This is Mortal Combat. Yes, but why? What is it, What is mortal? Do we ever truly die or does our mind just leave this physical shell? Stop and it. Go on to the great. Stop expense? it, Socrates. Stop it. <laughs> Hemlock. Fatality. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. You could do an entire podcast of just like hypothetical Mortal Kombat battles. 
between people in history. That might be fun. If you were creative enough, it'd be like a fun writing challenge. I'm sure that's been like, there's been some short video where people have done that. Or, or like, like a YouTube series. Or historical fighter. Like yeah. Historical figures have fought in like a fighting game looking thing. I'm sure that's a thing. Because um, you can pull from a lot of like entertaining people from history. I want to see like Cardinal Richelieu. Oh. Because he's so like comically gonna, evil. I was going to say life. like Teddy Roosevelt. Just. He might be fun, yeah. Um, he's just like riding a horse. He's like, bully. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt is like, he's not a perfect president. Obviously there's no perfect president in history, but he is like, interestingly, like one of the few presidents that I've seen like people on the left and right, like praise as a good president in history, which like, yeah. you never get in America. I mean, yeah, it is what it is. I mean, I'm so hesitant to praise any, any past president. I get even that. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Of he did a lot of great things in terms of like just smart things, but also like environment. And whatnot he, he he did some imperialism of course he nonsense did. that was just i was gonna bring that up next but anyway we have two buff dudes flexing each, before he, the battle flexing before the battle it's a tradition in every one of these fights actually yes. you're either gonna get some shadow boxing or some intense flexing and staring at one another which means that if either one of them survive they're gonna want to fuck after Yes. That's what I take away from that. Well, Shang Tsung's obviously been horny on Maine this entire fucking movie. <laughs> so. That's a whole excuse for this tournament. Yeah. This is like combat and chill. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Hey, girl, want to come over to my place and uh, watch some fatalities? You want to go for some uh, Mortal Kombat? Yeah. You know the French call fatality uh, le petit mort. You know what that means? <laughs> ah, baby. Oh, bleed. Nobody makes me bleed my own blood. <laughs> What else is like, because I know the guy who plays Shang Tsung has gone on to like be in a lot of other martial arts movies, which is interesting. And it's funny that they cast him for Kubo. Another guy, another Asian actor you had in your movie that you could have played the evil fucking god in We're your movie. We're not going to talk about it. Okay. We have an episode on that. We do. Go watch our Kubo and the Two Strings commentary. That movie made some mistakes. It did make some mistakes, but the commentary basically boils down to me saying I like this movie and Austin being like, You know we made way. no jokes in that movie? Commentary. I know we make bad jokes or attempts at humor yeah. in like other ones, but literally during that one, we made no jokes. I kind of strange. I think it was mainly because like I was talking about how much I love the movie and you were talking about how it. And I had a knife areas. to your throat the entire <laughs> time. <laughs> oh, he was in The Last Emperor. <gasps> Look who it is. Ah, uh, Gerald Nakamura of Samurai Cop. And I know. Vampire Assassin fame. Ah, uh, <laughs> it's so, it was so crazy for me to see him in the like climax of this movie. It's like, wow, they got Gerald Akamura for this. By the way, I was going to make this joke earlier, but I didn't. You know who needs to be a character in uh, Mortal Kombat? Who? Samurai Cop. Oh, wow. He has actually, he was also in Elektra. He was also in uh, Planet of the Apes. He's, who are you talking about? Uh, Shang Tsung's actor. Okay, so neither Gerald Akamura or Samurai Cop were in those movies. No, unfortunately. But they should be in Mortal Kombat 11. Samurai Cop, his... What would his finishing movie be? I'll keep keeping it warm for you. That's, Samurai I don't know Cop what decapitates somebody, be. doesn't he? I, I don't guess. Know. I, I haven't seen Samurai Cop in fucking forever. He turns their hair into a wig? It wasn't one of my favorites, so bad it's good movies. It was yeah. fun, but it wasn't like one of my best, one of the favorites. It's no Miami connection, I'm sorry. Um, which is also kind of similar to this movie in a certain sense. These both this movie and Miami connection, I think owe so much to just like the style of like combat martial arts movies that Bruce Lee yeah. had success with where he would do movies that were just like tournaments. Well, yeah. And Mortal Kombat was heavily influenced like by stuff like blood sport and things like that. So like, uh, I can never remember the proper names. What's the one with Chuck Norris? Is that Wave the Dragon or Enter the Dragon? Uh, Enter the Dragon. Okay, that's pretty much the same as this movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. Except there's no Chuck Norris getting the shit beat out of him, unfortunately. Yeah. So, I remember that was like a debate for a while, like because people had like collectively forgotten who won in that movie. Wasn't there like some... No, Chuck some, Norris loses. Yeah, wasn't there like some theory that there was like an American version, like the... No, I think the thing was that Chuck Norris actually beat Bruce Lee in a competition. Oh, at some point, I don't think that's true either. No, I think he did. I think he did, and Bruce Lee trained Chuck Norris. Uh, I'm gonna look that up because I do not want to sully. 
Bruce Lee. Yeah. Bruce Lee is much cooler than Chuck Norris. People make jokes about Chuck Norris, but really, like, he's, I think we're past that, and it's just like, whatever. Who he's, cares? He's an asshole who got famous for some reason. Um, also, Bruce Lee, much more interesting to watch on screen. Max, you're missing no. the dramatic moment. Oh, yeah, this wonderful character-building moment. Um, from what I can find, no, they <laughs> never actually fought. Mm, I don't know. I'll have to look that up, but I'll put the answer in the show notes. I, I would have a hard time, because they, like, they both fought in karate tournaments, and they both were trained martial artists, but like Bruce Lee invented his own kind of martial arts and like actually trained other people. I don't think Chuck Norris is quite on his level. I think, I don't know. For some reason, I get the impression that he trained Chuck Norris, and Chuck Norris eventually beat him, maybe after several tries or something. That sounds like a plot of a bad movie. Um. <laughs> That's often the way life goes. For example, there's a plot of a bad movie that's going on in our lives <laughs> as Americans every day. Uh, Mortal Kombat, the movie we're watching right now. God, I fucking wish they would fight each other in Mortal okay. Kombat. Austin, remember what we talked about before this? And you're like, yeah, okay, I'm not going to Everyone should be reminded. Everyone should be reminded. Don't take the sex out of Mortal Kombat. Um, <laughs> I love how spikes came out of the dragon specifically so that like Liu Kang doesn't have to directly like fucking rip this guy's head off. Right. Um, there's literally no other reason for that to happen. Do you think parents were... Con- what points at which parent do you think parents were confused while watching this movie? Uh, besides all of it, um, I think they might have been concerned when fucking sub zero froze the guy and he like his shattered head was on the feet. He's like, I took my kid to see this movie. But then again, if you're a parent in the nineties and like you are concerned about your child watching violent content and you haven't heard bad things about mortal combat, then like you would have been living under a rock and you yeah. deserved what. I mean, I think that's an interesting part of the movie that, or well, the game I get the impression of, yeah. um, originally when it was first made compared to this movie, whereas the game seems almost like, a kind of a cheeky reaction to stuff like video nasties and uh, the weird sort of suppression of anything that was violent going moral, on in the eighties and the satanic panic. panic. Yeah. yeah. Like it's such a like middle finger to that, that it kind of has a kind of uh, cleverness to it that I don't think this movie really achieves. Oh, no, no. Although maybe that also is only something that can be sort of like context specific right if you make something that's that cheeky about violence now it wouldn't have the same effect obviously no and it would come off as kind of like if you're trying to like it's self-satisfied com- that and like you if it would almost feel like a criticism on it because like we don't give a shit about violence anymore in America. Right. you can watch the most violent fucking shit ever in movies now right and video games look at the new mortal Kombat games yeah weirdly enough i think the at this point in time if you wanted to shock people and certainly something that always gets to me is if you had dreadfully realistic violence yeah because then it's just stomach churning and it's like you're not aestheticizing it at all it's just kind of like oh that's yeah, kind of making me upset heavily aestheticized violence is like its own thing now it's in a lot of movies yeah so why not oh no whoa, 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 no the very spikes that i called up from the floor have betrayed me no. it's even crazier because it's about to turn him into a cartoon and i'm sorry luke gang but that wasn't yeah, a no, flawless you, victory you got the shit kicked out of you for a while mate you could have just said fatality. Like, that would have made more sense. That was something I was thinking of, though, when he says yeah. that. Um, I There are multiple points in this movie where I'm thinking about, like, the like hypothetical parent yeah. in the audience and where they say something that is from the game and they expect the audience to recognize it. And the parent's like, what? Why do you say that? It's like, I guess that was a fatality, yeah? <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Oh, wait, we get to see Gerald Dockermura. Yeah, this is really funny. We noticed this the other day. Gerald Dockermura is one of the... <laughs> the souls floating through this like little <laughs> vortex. Where is he? No, that's not him. Hold on. Hold on. Where is it? God, I can't think of anything to say because now I'm transfixed yeah, just hard. waiting for this. I think they have to get through their stupid dialogue scene. What do you want to talk about instead until we see Gerald Akamura? Um, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I'm still transfixed on the Chuck Norris conversation from earlier. Cause like, I know he's a decent martial artist, but like I, I really can't like I've never heard him beating a fight in Bruce Lee. We'll look it up. We'll put the answer in the show notes. Yeah, I'm just I don't know. I know he made a brand of jeans that uh <laughs> made it so you could kick 
high with a roundhouse kick. Oh, there he, oh, yeah. oh, oh, there there he, he is. is. Yay, Gerald. <laughs> oh, man. God, I love that. Oh, my God. I expect you to be wearing those jeans at some point in the future for an episode and give us an update on uh, how they feel and yeah. whether or not you can kick in them. You kick at your new job, right? You do a lot of kicking. I don't know if you want to divulge where you work now, but like, it's pretty interesting. Uh, Chuck Norris's opinion on the matter. Would I have beaten Bruce Lee in a real competition or not? You'll forgive me for answering with another Bruceism, showing off the fool Id- yeah, fool's idea of glory. Um, oh, they didn't fight. I don't know. Yeah, they never fought in real life. Um, Max, they won. The way of the dragon, you can see. Oh, they, they saved the world with Mortal Kombat. Yay. Violence solves all of our problems. Yeah. I don't know if I finished saying it, but like it is kind of funny that they have to do it 10 times in a row. And it's like, I just think of like... It's it's the most video gamey plot ever. Raiden being like, I don't care this time. I'll just send <laughs> Joe fucking sh- whoever. Joey bag of donuts. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm going to send... Uh, that, that's who the guy was in the striped shirt earlier on. That was Joey, <laughs> Joey bag, bag of donuts. Um, and oh, this was a part that would fucking like parents would be like, what the hell is going on? Then it'll like have sure fucking hope this doesn't keep going. Yeah. The emperor. He's mad because he has to wait another like fucking 500 years. Although the emperor totally just killed all those children. Yeah. So the movie gets the violence in there. Yeah. Well, dun, dun, dun. that's movie. a great way to end any movie. Yeah. By yelling Mortal Kombat. Yeah. What would be the best movies to begin with somebody screaming Mortal Kombat? <laughs> we were talking about Steven Spielberg. You can always go with Schindler's List <laughs> as a great one. I was going to say that uh, movie we were talking about before the or last episode. The Seventh Seal. That uh, I was going to say, uh, Grave of the Fireflies. The <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> whoa, what are some other good ones? Bicycle Thieves. Uh, hmm. Just any like really sad, somber movie that like is a meditation on moral- like uh, mortality. Just open it with... This song and somebody's last screaming year, Mary and Bad. What if that was the thing Charles Foster Kane said? Those nope. were his last words, and that was the plot of Citizen Kane. <laughs> it was Rosebud, Mortal Kombat. And they're like, What is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what could he possibly be referring to when he says that? I don't know. And then at the end, like when they're chucking uh, all of like his stuff into the incinerator, you see them like throw a Mortal Kombat arcade machine instead of his sled. Or just like an outfit. Oh, God. Well, that'd be interesting. A copy of the cartridge, uh, the Super Nintendo version. I'm sure that'll be the remake of Citizen Kane. Yes. And this is the Mortal Kombat update. Uh, oh, this has been fun. <laughs> I had a good time doing this. You know, I did as well. Although, uh, oh, Tom Woodruff, hold on. He worked on Alien. Yeah. He anyway. He's one of the writers uh, for this movie. Um, the writers? I think so. Um, what? Let me. Th- I have the writers right here. No, he would have been a guy in a suit. Anyway. Uh, no, Kevin Droney. What am I fucking talking about? Never mind. Anyway, uh, I don't know if this episode has been a flawless victory. I think this episode has been uh, the least of us talking about the movie itself. I don't so think far. that's a bad thing, though. I no, it's okay. There are some movies that are just sort of generally... Purely harmless. Yeah. Yeah. Singers at Techno Club. Uh <laughs> I think we talked about like why it's like decent, but it's sort of like, especially after watching it several times in a week, it's just kind of no, like, it's, it's just not, it's not a movie to watch over and over again, but it's like, it's a fun to, time to put on. And I think it's a good thing to, yeah, and it's weird. And Christopher Lambert with his weird accent and wig. And yeah, also he's, uh, he did the, what the hell is that credit? There's just a big question mark in <laughs> <Yeah>. the credits. <laughs> well, I've never seen that before. But uh, he also uh, did his lines in the French version of this movie as well. And that's fun. Um, oh, God. What's but, fatality in French? Yeah. Let's look that <laughs> Well, anyway, this has been... Uh, the Spectator Film Podcast. And I'm Austin. I'm Max. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and our website. We have spite. <laughs> We're certainly spiteful. <laughs> Website, uh, spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We post new episodes every week, so... Don't hold us to that, you son of a bitch. Well, we have. We historically we post... We have epi- so far. <laughs> we historically post episodes every week. So uh, if you like this, you don't have to wait too long for a new one. So we hope to see you guys again soon. <laughs> if you like this. Well, anyway. 
Yeah, I, I think mean, that's pretty much it. Yeah. I want to keep talking, though. What else do you want to talk about? Do you? Um, you cut me off before I got to talk about the soundtrack of this movie. So you just sort of were just like, ah. We needed to talk about how bad it was at the beginning and get that out of the way. Otherwise, people would think we actually really thought this was a good movie. That's important. Oh, Frank Walker might be doing it.